If you have your Bibles, go ahead and take them out with me. We're going to jump away from John. I was going to give you one more teaching, but I just felt compelled as the week went on uh, in regards to this message. So if you have your Bibles, take it out, open it up. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 7. I'm going to pick up here in just a moment uh, in the 23rd verse. I've already said it this morning, but I, I want to say it again. I believe that Jesus is yet still alive. Amen? So I've entitled this morning's message. Somebody might say, well, Pastor, I think you're a week late. No, we celebrate the resurrected Savior every time we get together. Amen? So I've entitled this morning's message, The Resurrection and Our Salvation. The Resurrection and Our Salvation. We meet today, we realize every week, multiple times throughout the week, we, we meet in this place dedicated to worship. Why? Because of our faith in Jesus Christ. And that faith represents to us that our, our Jesus was raised from the dead, conquering death, sin, and the grave. So I've entitled this morning's message once again, The Resurrection and Our Salvation. Read along with me, Hebrews chapter 7, pick up in the 23rd verse. It says, now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able, catch this, to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Verse 26, such a high priest meets our need, one who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priest, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who are weak, but the oath which came after the law appointed the Son who has been made perfect forever. Father, we say thank you for your word this morning. God, once again, help us to capture your truth. God, your revelation, Lord, into our hearts this morning. God, and I, I once again just trust that your will would be done. God, in us, through us, change us, encourage us. God, whatever is necessary today that you might be glorified. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. If you look back to Hebrews 7, verse 25, it reads once again, Therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. The Phillips translation reads it this way. This means that he can save fully and completely those who approach God through him. For he is always living to intercede on their behalf. There's a, a unique difference between Christianity and every other religion that exists today. And I'm going to give you the uniqueness of it. Christianity is the only, call it religion, faith, whatever you want to call it, that claims a living founder. A living founder. Now there's other religions, I guess, that are out there whose founder hasn't yet died. But when he dies, we don't believe that he has the power to resurrect himself. That's the uniqueness. I mean, you can ask anybody of any other religion. They don't believe that their founder is actually still alive. They know that he's died, and they know that that founder has never come back. But Christianity, as we celebrated last week, we celebrate again today, we believe that Jesus was resurrected, that he's alive, seated at the right hand, the throne of God. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. We recognize, and he died on a cross outside of the walls of old Jerusalem. 
Then Jesus conquered death in the grave and ascended back to the Father. It's by His Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that He is present everywhere in the hearts of those who trust and also those who love Him. Christianity, then, is the good news about the Son of God who came, who lived, who died, and yet conquered death and continues to live even today. The uniqueness of Christianity. Our salvation is made possible and certain, catch this, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Just the fact that Jesus died would not have been enough. Jesus had to be raised back to life on the third day for you and I to have assurance in our salvation. Dr. Robert Lee in one of his sermons entitled, The World's Darkest Assumption, made this statement in that sermon, that if Christ be not raised, the church has no message for the world. The Christian has nothing to believe. Christian witnesses are telling falsehoods about God. Once again, if Christ be not raised. Our individual faith is an empty, lifeless shell. And the tragedy of tragedies is this. We are still in our sins. If Christ be not raised. Yet Paul, the Apostle Paul, declared that our salvation is based on our belief in the fact that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he was raised from the dead on the third day according to scriptures. Let me give you one more. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15. Don't lose Hebrews 7. I may have told you that too late. We're going to go back there. I hope you have your Bible because you're probably not going to find this on the screen. I forgot to pass this along. 1 Corinthians 15. Look at it in verse 3. The Apostle Paul writes, for, I received, for what I received I passed on to you as of first importance. That Christ died for our sins according to scriptures. That he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to scriptures. And that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. Verse 6, after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time. Most of whom are still living. Though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James. Then to all the apostles. And last of all, he says, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. What is this? This is Paul's discussion, Paul's claim in regards to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Back now with me to Hebrews chapter 7. We realize that Christianity is based on the faith that Jesus has been raised from the dead as the first fruits from among the dead. And I want to give you four thoughts over the next few moments this morning in regards to the resurrection. Number one. The resurrection vindicates Jesus of Nazareth as being God's unique son. God's unique son. During his lifetime in ministry, Jesus revealed his unique person, not only by the marvelous words that fell from his lips, but I would say also the marvelous works that came from his hands And from his words. He talked as man had never spoken before. They were awestruck when Jesus talked. His disciples came to believe that he was more than just a man, and they would go on to say he was more than just a prophet. Peter spoke for them in his remarkable confession of faith in which he expressed his belief that Jesus was the Son of God. Think think this through with me. Matthew chapter 16, Jesus is there, and many of the crowd had left, and he's sitting there with his disciples, and he begins to question him. He gets to the final question, and basically he says, but who do you say that I am? Because if you remember, some had remarked, well, he might be Elijah, might be one of the prophets, 
thoughts of who Jesus might would be. But catch this. This is Peter, the disciples. Those who listened to Jesus every day, saw Jesus every day, walked with Jesus, lived with Jesus. Matthew 6, verse 16 God, Jesus, asked him, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Christ, the Son of the living God. He was capturing the revelation of who Jesus is. And we recognize, once again, number one, the resurrection vindicates Jesus of Nazareth as being God's unique son, that he is, that he is, that he yet still is, the living son of God. Number two, the resurrection of Christ declares the crucifixion to be a revelation of divine love for sinners rather than just a horrible execution, a revelation of divine love for sinners rather than just a horrible execution. For the apostles, the death of Jesus was really a personal catastrophe, a public disgrace, we would say, a political disappointment. For the Father God, though, it was the revealing of His suffering love, of His redeeming power to save sinners from the consequences of sin. A dramatic difference between how the apostles viewed the crucifixion of Jesus and how Father God Himself viewed the crucifixion of His one and only begotten son once again to those that were living to the apostles it was a personal catastrophe a public disgrace a political disappointments they lived in the anguish they they lived in the suffering of the one that they had surrendered their life to the one that they had put their hope in had now been crucified but to god father god it was the revealing of his suffering love, his redeeming power to save sinners from the consequences of their sins. Think of it this way. It was through the doorway of the empty tomb that the apostles were able to visualize the cross as the instrument of God's redeeming love. They didn't really capture it until they saw the tomb and recognized that the tomb was empty, that Jesus was not there. Something must have happened to Jesus. And just a little bit later, they realized that he was resurrected. And it was through that revelation, through the doorway, we would say, of the empty tomb that the apostles were able to visualize the cross as God's redeeming love for mankind. Once again, the, the, the resurrection, the resurrection of Christ declares the crucifixion, the crucifixion to be a, a revelation of Christ, of God's divine love for sinners, not just this horrific, horrible execution. You know, if there had been no resurrection, I tend to believe that the death of Jesus would never have been understood as a revelation of God's great love to redeem sinners. Think of it. Without the resurrection, I don't believe anybody would have looked to the cross as that divine act of love of God of giving his son and of Jesus laying down his life. But because he was resurrected, because Jesus lives. As Hebrews 7 declares, now that there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office, but because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Being able to completely save, to fully save those 
those who come to him believing in him and choosing to ask for forgiveness and receiving the love of God within their life. The death of Jesus for sin was a once for all substitutionary sacrifice that covers our sin dead. 1 Peter 3.18 declares, For Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God to bring me to God, to bring each one of us. He doesn't have to keep dying. He's paid the price once for all, the Bible declares, so that we can live eternally with him, that we can live with our sins washed clean through the blood of Jesus. Why? Because he lives. Because he lives. Number three, the resurrection gives us an intercessor in the presence of God. An intercessor in the presence of God. Go back to verse 25 with me. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Jesus Christ, our great high priest, according to scriptures, has entered into the most holy place with his own sacrificial death as an atonement for our sins and is seated at the right hand of God continuously making intercession for our lives. I mean, we believe in intercessory prayer. We have an intercessory prayer team that prays all week for our services, praying for you, praying for me, praying for each one of us. We have a prayer chain here at the church when we recognize there's needs interceding and praying for, for people that are in moments of suffering, in moments of pain, in moments of difficulty of life. And it's beautiful. It's beautiful that as a church we continuously have people interceding on behalf of one another. But hear it, how much more beautiful that Jesus is at the right hand of God making intercession for each one of us. I, I, I'll be honest with you, I, I couldn't think of anybody else who I'd want to pray for. I mean, I, I think there's a lot of great people praying for each other right here at Cornerstone Church, but who better to pray for me than Jesus? Who better to pray for you than Jesus? And he does, why? Because he's resurrected, because he lives, yet he's making intercession for us. John, in his first epistle, wrote to encourage believers not to live a life of sin. He makes this statement in 1 John chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. He begins it, my little children. Understand, because he's old at this time, and everybody's a little child to John. It's not a, it's not a bad statement. He says, I'm writing this to you so that Hear it, you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the expiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the world. Once again, Hoping that we would not sin. But if we do stumble and fall, if we do sin, that Jesus is yet still interceding for us. I believe every single one of us need the ministry of a divine advocate. We need the ministry of Jesus. We need the prayers of Jesus. Over and over and over again into our lives. So once again, let me give these to you briefly. The resurrection vindicates Jesus of Nazareth as being God's unique son. I believe, once again, it was the resurrection of Jesus that dramatically declared Jesus to be the unique son of God. Number two, the resurrection of Christ declares the crucifixion to be a revelation of divine love for sinners rather than just a horrible execution. With that in mind, the death of Jesus for sin was a once-for-all substitutionary sacrifice that covers all of our sins. Number three, 
the resurrection gives us an intercessor in the presence of God. And once again, I believe all of us, all of us need the ministry of a divine advocate. And lastly, for you, number four, the resurrection gave to the believers a living Lord and companion. Let me say it again. The resurrection gave to the believers a living Lord and a companion. Jesus, if we were to reflect back over this, began his ministry by saying, follow me. Follow me. And I want you to realize, even today, yet he continues to extend that invitation. Follow me. Now think of it. I can't ask you to follow me if I'm not living. I have to be living in order to ask you to follow me. But just as Jesus began his earthly ministry by, by, by calling out to his disciples, follow me, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Follow me. Yet he still calls out today to each one of us. I, I believe that's why each one of us are here today because we heard the invitation. We received the invitation to, to come and to follow Jesus. Come and to follow a risen Savior. Come and to follow a living Lord from one day to the next day. The living Lord walks and talked with his disciples. He, he didn't say, just follow me, but he literally talked with them. And he walked with them. He taught them and showed them how they could become better disciples and how they could make disciples. And yet he still does the same thing today. He doesn't just ask us to follow him, but because Jesus is living, he talks to us. He walks with us, training us to be a disciple and then training us to go in to make disciples. Why? Because Jesus lives. He lives. He calls us to follow him and he walks with us. He talks with us. Jesus instructed his disciples that they were to teach new disciples to obey his commandments and to follow his example. And because Jesus is our living Lord, because he is our living companion, he continues this same ministry today and wants to assist us as we seek to help others to become his disciples. Why? Because Jesus lives. He's yet still resurrected. We sang that new song. He's the same God. He's the same God. He parted the waters then. He'll part the waters now. Why? Because he's living. He's not dead and vanished and gone forever. He's yet still alive. He saved then. He saves now. He healed then. He heals now. Why? Because he is our resurrected living Lord. He is yet still our companion today. He delivers then. He still delivers now. He helped then. He wants to help us now. Why? Because he's yet still our resurrected Lord, our living Lord and the companion of our lives. I'll say it one last time. I still believe that Jesus is alive. I wouldn't dare try to sing it, but I had this song in my head all week long. He walks with me. He talks with me along life's. Y'all know it. I'm not going to sing it. I'm going to save you this morning. But that song was playing in my head over and over. I would have asked Corey to sing it. He'd be looking at me like, what? Never heard that song before in my life. Yeah. Didn't want to put him on the spot. Why can we sing that song? Because we still serve a living Lord. A risen Savior who's with us today. Think of it, just as he walked along the road of Emmaus with those disciples, he wants to walk along the road with you today. 
He comes to us in our times of prayer. He comes to us in our places of worship. He comes to us in the need of those about us. I wonder, have, have you yet trusted in Jesus as the Savior of your life? Because once again, He wasn't just the Savior then and stopped being a Savior today. He's still saving lives today. Have you surrendered your life to Jesus today? Have you, have you dedicated all of yourself I'm not just talking about the portions of my life that I want to dedicate. Why? Because Jesus is interested in all of us. In all of my life. I believe He comes today. And He knocks on the door of our hearts. Wondering, will we let Him in? Will we let Him in? Will we let Jesus become our Savior, our healer, our restorer, our friend that Jesus desires to be today? Would you stand to your feet with me this morning, church?